then uh, maybe the, the legal team can also assist. I think it's coming closer to what Honorable Fanstaden has, has been asking, is that and then it is now up to us as the committee to go again and seek the and, and do the the public participation where we consult people through public hearings so that it is it goes that route. Or oh, because there are the, only these two editions, it just goes to parliament. I'm just I just want to clarify on that one. Otherwise, on the issue of the wedding and that, I know that there is a process that has to be followed. Uh, thank you. Minister, over to you. Yeah. Thank, th thank you, Honorable Chairperson and members for, for the input. Honorable Chairperson, now that we have introduced the bill to Parliament on the 9th of October, uh, it is up to Parliament, in terms of Parliament, the rules and regulations to decide whether you want to do uh, pu public hearings. That's, that's completely in, in, in your right. Um, from the department side, uh, from December 2018, uh, like we said in the introduction, until March, I think, uh, 2019, uh, the public participation took place. And then from there, um, uh, in, in, in drafting uh, the, the bill, the input from the public were considered. And that is why um, I think attached to the presentation today is a, an NXJA where we are making that available to the portfolio committee to see what transpired during that process, because we categorized uh, the 50,000 inputs into different categories. And, and, that, and that is certainly um, available, Chairperson. Um, I just want to come back to, and I'm sure the legal team will explain further, but I just want to also come back to Honorable Yeekland about the immovable asset register, which we briefed um, the portfolio committee on last week. And like we have explained before, that when we speak land reform, land reform includes a redistribution, restitution, land tenure, and expropriation. Expropriation is but one mechanism for acquisition. But it's not totally correct to say that uh, there was no land uh, redistribution. We've just seen recently uh, that the Minister of, of Land Affairs, Minister Toka Didisa, made, <laughs> excuse me, made available over 7,000, 700,000 hectares of land for agriculture. Last year, October, Cabinet approved of 14,000 hectares also for uh, human settlement purposes. Um, DPWI also released uh, almost 200 pieces of land for, for, for land restitution. So it is an all-encompassed process and that the presidential advisory panel and the recommendations that they've made, 85% um, 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 of those recommendations were, were accepted by government. So uh, it is not just uh, that land reform is just about expropriation. Expropriation is about uh, one, one mechanism for acquisition that we can use if and when it's needed. And the bill uh, spells out how it can be done. As, we sp uh, as it stands currently, the president has got powers to expropriate all nine premiers in the country, all nine provinces, all municipalities have got powers to expropriate, and also at least seven national ministers. What was absent um, was a law of general application that can bring consistency, which was not provided for in the 1975 Act uh, that this bill seeks to, to, to repeal. So the question to say it is only the minister that's going to decide is not correct. Um, but I will leave the legal questions for the legal people to answer, Chairperson.
Um, I don't know who wants to start first, um, Honorable uh, Butlender or Honorable uh, Naidu. I, I, uh, Minister, I, if I'm a chairperson, if I may start, I will do so. I'll ask my colleague Advocate Naidu to deal with the question of required public consultation. Yes. If I can then deal, I, I think it's important to to start at the beginning and to recognize, the beginning is to recognize that in probably every country in the world, the law permits the state to expropriate property. This is not a peculiarly South African provision. It exists everywhere that the, st the state is allowed to expropriate property for the public good. And there's nothing really controversial about the principle of expropriation. It's called different things in different countries. In the United States, they call it eminent domain. In the former British, coloni British colonies, they usually call it compulsory acquisition. It goes, has different names in different countries, but everywhere in the world, uh, property can be expropriated for the public good by the state. And so everybody who owns property is, in theory, has the risk of their property being expropriated. The house where I'm sitting at the moment could be expropriated. It's always been capable of being expropriated. Uh, that, the, the principle of expropriation, of, of permissible expropriation, is therefore not really controversial. What is sometimes controversial is what compensation should be paid, what procedure should be followed, and whether there are limits on the purposes for which expropriation may take place. But the, the, the principle of expropriation shouldn't be a, a controversial one. It's been part of our law as far as anyone can remember and everywhere else in the world. Similarly, I think it's important to clarify that expropriation legislation doesn't deal with who's going to get the land. The land goes in the first instance to the state. But if land is expropriated for land reform purposes, for example, for land redistribution, it's not the expropriation law or the expropriation process which will decide who will be the beneficiaries. That will be dealt with by a minister who's responsible for land reform. If land is expropriated for, for housing purposes, the purpose of the people, again, it's not the expropriating minister who decides who will get the houses. That's dealt with by the municipalities and the provincial governments who are responsible for allocating land for state-owned land for housing. And so one needs to separate conceptually the, notion, the, the question of when may land be expropriated and what compensation and procedure are required from the question of who will, who will get the land. So it's not, for example, it's not, it's not really so that land becomes liable to, land qualifies to be expropriated because it has been occupied or because it has been this or because it has been that, it always is potentially can be, can be, can be, uh, can be expropriated. The trigger is a trigger about compensation, which I'll come to. So then against that background, recognizing that expropriation is simply part of the ordinary law of every country in the world that I know of. There may be countries which don't have expropriation provisions in their law, but if they are, they are very unusual outliers. Uh, and recognizing that it's not the expropriator who decides, the uh, expropriating authority who decides who gets the benefit, it's the state department which is responsible. And I don't want to say anything about that. So then if I can go to this, against that background to some of the questions which were raised, in relation to the question by the Honorable Sarisa, urgent expropriation is dealt with by clause in clause 22 of the bill. And urgent expropriations become available when something happens which was unanticipated and you need to get hold of the land for public purposes or public use very urgently. An easy example is when there's a flood. If there's a bad flood and something needs to be done on, the, on some land in order to reduce the flood, flood Canals need to be, canals need to be dug, pipes need to be inserted, and some of this may be on private land. What urgent expropriation allows is it allows the state to move in to take the use of the property for a limited period while this disaster situation exists and while it's being addressed. So it's about those sorts of situations where there's a sudden and unexpected need, a disaster arises, a crisis arises, and private land needs to be used in order to solve the disaster or the crisis. And then section 20 or clause 22 acts provide, uh, comes into play. What clause 22 provides is the following. 
Firstly, in clause 22, subsection, sub clause 1, it says it can only be, the use can only be expropriated. You, please, what one needs to note is it's not ownership was expropriated. What is expropriated is the right to use the property. And uh, so an urgent expropriation can be carried out, which gives the right to use the property temporarily for not exceeding 12 months. And that's the usual limit. Then what it says in clause 22 sub 7, that if the expropriation authority wants to extend that beyond 12 months and the owner doesn't agree, then the expropriating authority can apply for an extension of the 12 months. And what clause 22 8 says is that extension can't be for more than 18 months. So it's ordinarily for 12 months, you can get a court to extend it, but a court can't extend it for more than 18 months. Then in relation to the supremacy clause, I, I, I agree respectfully with the honorable member that the use of that term is a bit confusing because we do, it's the constitution of course, which is supreme. There is the supreme law of the country. But what this bill provides, is, which is quite, again, quite commonplace, is it says this bill will apply to all expropriations. If there is an existing law which authorizes expropriation, that law must now be brought in, must, must, that expropriation must be done in accordance with this bill when it becomes an act. There are municipal ordinances, there are old provincial ordinances, there are many other laws which deal with, with expropriation, and many of them are inconsistent with the Constitution. What, this, the, what the so-called supremacy clause says is all other acts of parliament dealing with expropriation are now subject to this act. But it doesn't make them, doesn't put this or attempt to make this, uh, this act above, above the Constitution. The Constitution is, of course, supreme, the supreme law in all respects. So uh, that the use of the term supremacy is, or uh, term supremacy clause is, with respect, of, a bit misleading. Then the question of uh, Honourable Graham asked the question: If the land is not being used. Uh, who will decide whether this land is going to be expropriated, whether compensation will be paid, and so on? Well, the short answer is that if the, the, the court will have to decide whether the, if one's looking at the, the clause 12.3 provisions, which is what the honorable member was referring to, the ones which deal with possible uh, mill compensation, it will be the, if we could just go there, it's 12.3, which is on slide. Uh, 16, this list, if we can, and I can just deal with clause 12.3a as an example. One of the circumstances that may justify the payment of mill compensation is where the land is not being used and the owner's main purpose is not to develop the land or use it to generate income, but to benefit from appreciation or its market value. If a dispute arises, a court will have to decide, firstly, does this, fall, this land fall within this category? Is it land which is not being used and the owner's main purpose is to use it, is to hold on to it to, to appreciate its market value? If yes, then the court will have to decide whether that, whether in this particular case that justifies no market value. So in both the question of whether it falls inside the category and if it does fall inside the category, whether no compensation would be just and equitable is a matter will be decided by the court. So, uh, and one can go through all of those criteria and in each case, the test is the question whether it falls within the categories for the court and the amount of compensation is decided by the court. That's what section 34 of our constitution requires. So, and just to repeat what I said earlier, the failure to exercise control is not the test for whether the property is suitable for expropriation. It's a much broader test. Then the question of, I've dealt, I think, with the question of the allocation of land, uh, that the expropriation bill doesn't deal and never deals with the question of who will get the use of the land and control the land. That is dealt with by the body which, for, by the body which will become the owner of the land, the national government, the province, or the local authority. Uh, Chairperson, I think I've dealt with all of the other legal questions. Uh, some of them are policy questions, of course, which are not in my territory, uh, questions of other available land and so on. 
And I, if I may, I'd like to ask Advocate Naidu to deal with the question of public consultation, what public consultation is required on, on this bill. Good morning, Madam Chairperson and honorable members of the committee. The short answer is that section 591A of the constitution prescribes that um, parliament and in particular the National Assembly must facilitate public involvement in all its legislative and other processes, not just before the assembly itself, but also before its committees. This issue was dealt with by the Constitutional Court in 2018, I believe, when an Act of Parliament had been uh, passed and public consultation had been facilitated. But at a during the when an Amendment Act was sought to be passed, following consultation at the committee level, an insertion was made into the Act to make it applicable to the veterinary profession but the vets were not consulted. The Amendment Act was challenged successfully by the uh, Veterinary Association of South Africa and the Constitutional Court found that the National Assembly and its committees had failed to comply with their 591A responsibilities. So the answer is that at least insofar as the new clauses are concerned, that's 12.3, and 12.4, public consultation would be mandatory, else the bill would be vulnerable to constitutional attack. Thank you. Thank you. Any other additions or? Yeah, my hand is up. Uh, before you, uh, Honorable Hicklin, um, I'm just checking with the minister and, and, and her team that uh, there are no other uh, responses. Okay, if, if then there are no other responses, um, Honorable Hicklin, yes. I thought someone wanted to speak. Okay. Um, Honorable Hicklin, followed by Honorable Van Steden, followed by Honorable Siwisa, and then we're taking the, the second round of questions and comments. Honorable Hicklin, followed by Honorable Van Steden, followed by Honorable Siwisa. Thank you so much, Chair. Minister, I hear what you're saying about there being a a, a broader grouping of people who are going to decide in, in inverted commas on whether land is um, being expropriated or not. But the point that I'm actually trying to make to you, Minister, and I am imploring you as the head of this department to ensure that our immovable asset register gets updated urgently because until we have an appropriate, a comprehensive and a complete immovable asset register, we cannot begin the allocation, appropriate, proper, considered allocation of land. Right now, what we are doing is we're trying to put, push water up a hill and it's flowing through our fingers because we don't have a clue exactly how much land we own and where. And until we get a comprehensive IAR, we, this, this process is doomed to failure. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Honorable Van Steden. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, now, I agree with, with Member Hickling before me. It's very important to get that register up to date. Um, otherwise, we're going to pick up some problems in the future. Mike, uh, thank you for the answer about the public participation process. Uh, it is um, according to, to my view, it's, it's necessary that the law be um, handling in that way and that that process be followed by this committee. But the Honourable Minister made a, a comment about, I think, the previous process had 50,000 uh, um, comments uh, on this bill. 
<laughs> and it's probably impossible to ask, but is it possible to 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 um, give this committee because most of us are, are, are new members of this committee um, inputs in that comments from from a, from a previous um, round? Is it possible? Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Suiza. Thank you, Chair. Mine is, is based on Chairperson. I heard the response of the minister when she said that there were submissions that were made. And now when I go to her and extra A, it seems as if it's mostly bought its, its entities. And I'm asking myself, when are we going to do? When are the people that are actually affected? Because you'd find that people on the ground, people in the rural areas, are they going to be consulted face-to-face to, -face to make their submissions? Because now we are talking about people that had access to internet. What about those ones that don't have access to internet? What is, what is her taking on that one? Because those people are the ones that are going to be mostly affected by this whole thing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable members, um, minister, and your team. Thank, uh, thank you, honorable chairperson. Uh, to start with honorable Sawisa, the, uh, the public consultation must be undertaken by parliament. It's mandatory. So as members of parliament, you will decide how and where you are going to do the public participation. Uh, like it was explained by um, Advocate Naidu. So the, the annexure that, that we have pro uh, provided was sort of a summary of the 50,000, which uh, came in when the department, uh, DPWI gazetted the bill uh, in December of 2018. But nothing stopped Parliament. In fact, you must do it, and the committee will decide how they are going to do it. I think just on the immovable asset register, it's not that we don't know where are the parcels of land that belongs to the state. The issues that was raised by the Auditor General um, for the past four or five years is that the way and how we determine the value of the land. Uh, and we've discussed this before when it comes to the value of the land. Uh, we have now have an agreement with uh, the National Treasury that if we want to dispose land in terms of Guillermo, the, the Government Immovable Asset Management Act, that we will be allowed to use the municipal value. Now, also in Guyama, it doesn't say that you must dispose land at a market value. It says it must be best value. And, and, and so that is sometimes also caused the delay of disposing of land. But there is a, a, a register maybe 98% complete and another 2% that must still be added to the register, but we know where those parcels of land are. Uh, uh, it's, it's all over the country. And uh, certainly, like we explained to members in the previous committee, that is one of the issues that is a priority for the department now, that we now need to uh, uh, put uh, the, the, the land immovable asset register. Uh, we need to digitize it, we need to computerize it. And, and that is the process that has started now to put all of this on, 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 uh, on a computer so that we, we have a digitized immovable asset register. And the Auditor General has commended us for starting the process uh, to digitize our immovable um, asset uh, register. Um, I've answered the one in public hearings. I think those were the two for me, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you very much.
thank you, Chairperson. Minister. Okay. Chairperson, if I can just add to the response on the asset register. In the last audit of the Auditor General, on the five assertions with respect to the auditability of the asset register, the existence of the assets, the completeness of the register, the rights and obligations, and the valuation, we were qualified on one item, which is the valuation. So the asset register was not qualified on issues of existence or completeness. So there has been a substantial improvement since uh, the period of time that the honorable member is referring to where certain assets could not be located. So I'm, I want to provide assurance that uh, the asset register and the quality uh, has improved substantially since the particular incident referred to by the member. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Minister and, and Acting DG. Um, in the absence of uh, questions from the... From one, the last, one last question, Chair, sorry. <laughs> the third, uh, but uh, this is the very last, uh, Honorable Suiza, so that we continue. Yes. Okay. Sorry for interruption. My question was not answered also. Okay, Honorable Kobane's questions, she asked it on the first round of questions. Uh, she feels that it was not uh, answered. Minister, uh, oh, first let's take uh, Honorable Suisa's comments. Yes, Honorable Suisa. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, since we were taken through Section 25 of the Constitution, and I'm going to go specifically to 25 subsection 3B, where it says history of acquisition, that part only. What does the bill say if it is found out that the land was, acqu the acquisition was illegal? What does the bill say about if we, we, we are faced with such a, if, if, if the department is going to be faced with such a, such a circumstance or such, such um, something that, something to do with uh, Honorable Suisa has acquired the land illegally. So, so what does the bill say in those instances? Thank you, Chair. When, when responding, Honorable Minister, also, also uh, explain um, Honorable Kopane's uh, comment that she raised earlier on. Thank you. Oh, well. oh, Honorable Chairperson, thank you. Honorable Kopane, uh, uh, please accept my apologies. Um, uh, Advocate Naidu dealt with the second part of your question, which was the public participation. Um, the the socioeconomic impact study, uh, it is, it's part of the legislative process that before a bill can be introduced to cabinet, the relevant ministry is required to send it to the Department of, of Public, I mean, the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation to do a socioeconomic impact study. We can certainly provide uh, the committee with their report uh, from the DPME as, as, as part of your consideration. So my apology for that. I will make sure that the members receive that report from DPME. Thank you, Chairperson. And then the legal one from Honorable Sawisa can be answered by the legal team. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If I may answer it, the, the, the purpose of expropriation is to acquire ownership from the lawful owner or from those who hold informal rights. It doesn't deal, expropriation doesn't deal with unlawful owners or unlawful holders because they don't have the right of ownership. The whole the essence of, of uh, expropriation is ownership is transferred from the current lawful owner to a new lawful owner, which it will become the state. And so if the land is, equal, is illegally owned, if it's been stolen in some way, uh, if there's some, some other illegality, then the remedy is not to expropriate the land, but the remedy is to, is to reverse the illegality 
and to put the land back in the ownership of the person who's entitled to it. So it's not a question of illegal owners. I think what, when people talk about the use of the, of the history of the acquisition of use, very often that's a reference to land which was acquired through forced removals. That's often what is in people's mind. Black people were removed from land, three and a half million people were removed from land through forced removal. And where land was, was removed from, uh, when land was acquired through a forced removal, that is a fact which, a, which a, a court may consider relevant to deciding how much compensation would be just and equitable. You can look around Cape Town particularly, not only Cape Town, there, of course the, it's now quite a long time ago, but there were situations where people benefited and profited from forced removal. And it would be possible to argue in a court that if you benefited and profited from forced removal, you should give up that benefit and profit. I think that's the, the sort of history of acquisition and use which is most commonly referred to. But it doesn't deal with illegal use. Illegal ownership is not ownership at all. And you don't have to be expropriated because if you're there illegally, you're not the owner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Person, thank you. Chairperson, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Um, let me again uh, appreciate the the clear presentation that was made to us as as the committee. I think as the committee now, it's it's then up to us to take this forward uh, as we indicated that. This this bill seeks to correct um, and and reject the Expropriation Act of 1975, which we all agree that it is long overdue. It doesn't talk to the constitution that we adopted as the country in 1996. It talks to those apartheid laws. Um, but we will we will then, as the, the committee continue debating this looking at the um, at the, the 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 participation of the public the comments that we will seek from the public uh, other than what you did as the executive i think as the committee we also have a role to play in in taking this forward before it is adopted by the by the parliament um, i really appreciate uh, the presentation from yourself and your legal team um, I, I think now, uh, Ms. Nola, let's go to the to the second item of our um, of our agenda, and and we you are then free, Minister, and your team to to leave the meeting as as we deal with other issues that relate uh, maybe to the how do we take forward this as as the as the committee, Ms. Thank Nola. You. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, I'm not sure if I can just proceed now or should I wait for the department to leave or we can just carry on. I know, carry on, carry on, carry on. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, according to Rule 2864I, um, we the committee needs to adopt a motion of desirability and this is obviously because we've just had a presentation from the department clarifying exactly all the clauses of the expropriation bill. So um, if I may, honorable chairperson, read rule 2864I. It says after due deliberation, the committee must consider a motion of desirability on the subject matter of the bill. And if rejected, must immediately table the bill and its report on the bill. So around this time, chairperson, I would, I would like to request you to call for the mover for the adoption of the motion of desirability of this bill and thereafter is a second. And if there's any opposing view, then we'll record that on, on the minutes or, or rather call for a vote if, if in an event where uh, there's a need for a vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. La, apologies uh, for that. Uh, as I'm preparing for the sitting, uh, remember, Public works will also be part of the debate. Uh, can you just uh, repeat the last part of your this issue of the vote? All right. I was saying, Honourable Chairperson, um, that you would call for a mover uh, for the adoption of the desirability of the bill, 
and then thereafter a seconda. And if there's any opposing view, then we can always call for a vote, Honorable Chair. I see Ms. Ngema has raised a hand. I'm not sure whether it's deliberate or perhaps you can give her a chance to speak. Thanks, Chair. Okay, uh, Honorable Members, Ms. Ngema is from the Parliament Legal Services who is attached to our committee. I think let's give her uh, to speak. Ms. Ngema. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, greetings to all the honorable members and everybody present. Chairperson, I just uh, thank you for noting me. I just wanted to add an important part on the question of public participation, which does not derail from what they have said and what Ms. Nola was currently dealing with in terms of the desirability of the bill. But Chairperson, I just thought I need to point out um, this crucial fact, the bill that is before the committee right now in its entirety is introduced and open to public participation, not only with the reservations to those two that I knew which were not part of the remitted bill. The entire bill, every clause that is in the current bill is now open to public participation and every part of it must then be taken through the process and not only be restricted to those that were mentioned as they knew, but focus could then be streamlined to those specifically that are new and maybe get more at give it more attention and give it more attention. So that is basically what I needed to point out uh, in alignment with what the department indicated, as well as taking forward the process on the desirability and the processes of taking the bill through its legislative process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nyama. I think I think you have uh, assisted us a lot. Um, uh, I think I saw Honorable Graham's hand uh, and Honorable Van Skalvig's hand uh, up. Um, please note, Honorable Members, Honorable Van Skalvig, um is not well. So when she speaks, we she may not speak as we are used to her speaking. But her head is up. Honorable Graham Mare. Thank you, Chair Shem. I'm sorry to hear that Honorable Van Skolpek isn't well. I'm, I hope it's nothing serious. Um, yeah, just with respect to this whole process. So, so we're being asked now to vote on the desirability of this bill as it stands. Um, and then at what point do we determine whether or not um, we are going to proceed with public participation? So do we have to vote on the desirability first and then put it through for public participation? Or can we insist that the public participation um, happens before the desirability part of it? Sorry if I'm being ignorant, but I've never done this before. So I, I really, really would like some clarity. Thank you, Honorable Graham Murray. Uh, Honorable Franz Calvi. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and good morning, everyone. I would like to move for the motion of desirability in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Franz Kalvik. Honorable Franz Kalvik is, is moving for the desirability. Um, can I get a second before Nola explains to Honorable Graham Mare the process that we're going to follow? We, we need first to agree uh, on the desirability, Honorable Graham Mare. Uh, can I get a second on, on, on what Honorable uh, Van Skalvik has moved? Honorable Mjobo? Uh, thank, um, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, members. I'd like to support Honorable Van Skalvik. Thank you, Honorable Mjobo. Uh, we we'll got a mover and a, and a second. Uh, Honorable uh, Miss Martinez, can you explain to Honorable Graham Murray why we had to start by first adopting this uh, the desirability part before we outline the process? Can you can you can you do that? I understand that uh, Miss um, uh, Ngema tried, uh, but can you can you because there is also a process which has not yet been tabled. I, I suspect that the reason Honorable Graham Mara is asking those questions is because the, the process that has to be followed has not been clearly tabled so that we understand what is going to be done. 
Can you then come in, Ms. Martinese? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, just to come in um, and respond to Honorable Graham Murray's uh, question or other concern, the, if you remember, honorable members, um, there was a presentation that was done on how to process legislation in its, in, in, its, in its entirety, which is then the process that will follow while processing this bill. And Rule 286 um, clearly outlines what process needs to be followed. And as the honorable chairperson has alluded, I will then zoom into the actual process uh, according to our draft project plan that we've drafted as the support personnel of this committee, which was tabled to Menkwa yesterday. So prior to that, we thought we should rather start with the motion of desirability. So this is part of the process that needs to be followed. It's a formality that is required as per rule 2861 uh, that I read. So uh, Honorable Graham Murray, we need to do this process, get, get this over and done with, and then zoom into the, the draft project plan, way in which we are outlining all the activities that will follow uh, throughout the project. Thanks, Chairperson. Uh, I, I just hope that other program Mara is, is, uh, uh, is satisfied with the with the explanation that you have given uh, Ms. Martinez. Can we then, uh, having um, uh, moved and adopted the desirability, can we move then? Now, uh, Ms. Martinez, Thanks, Chair. I would like, before we move to the minutes, I would like to just uh, share the, the draft project plan so that we can take members through it um, and to also exactly allay the fears that members would have. And obviously, because this is a new committee, so um, as previously stated during our presentation, we did say that we'll take members through each and every step of the process that we'll have to follow. Um, first and foremost, in this draft plan, we have uh, color coded um, our tasks. The green tasks are tasks that have already been completed um, during this uh, during the processing of the bill. The orange one would be tasks that are not yet completed but are currently underway. And then uh, the red ones, which we don't currently have, would have been then tasks that would not have been completed. So at this point, we're still going well. We're still doing fine according to our projected timelines. The white areas are areas that are that are yet to be to be completed, which would be highlighted as pending. So, if I may, Honourable Chairperson, I'll start with the first one. The introduction and tabling of the bill was done HSC 145 2020 on the 14th of October, as per the presentation by the department. So that would then appear as completed. So the second one, Honorable Chair, was the process planning, which I've just referred to, uh, which was a presentation that was done by ourselves, the support personnel of the committee, uh, in which we produced a briefing note and the presentation on the 26th of October. And that would also be flagged as completed, but was also highlighted green. Thereafter, the bill was tagged as a Section 76 bill through the JTM, which Ms. Ngema is part of. Um, that was done on the 29th of October. After that, the bill was referred to the National House of Traditional Leaders through our bill's office. Um, this was done ATC 161-2020 by uh, Mr. Neil Bell from our bill's office. And it was done on the 6th of November this year. Um, so the reason why you'd see that under that one task, there are, there are two tasks that, that are supposed to um, be completed there, which is one, the, 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 the referral, which was done on the 6th of November. Now, we are awaiting the submission of the NHGL comments, uh, which is the National House of Traditional Leaders comments. They're supposed to submit the documents to us by um, the 6th of the 12 months of the 12th month of 2020, because um, they get given 30 days um, to respond and give us their comments after the bill has been um, referred to them. So today we've just had the briefing by the department on the expropriation bill. So that will also after this meeting be flagged as a completed task because it was done today. The motion of desirability, which we've also just done, we have adopted the motion of desirability that will also be updated um, after today's meeting as a completed task. Then moving over to the, the topic of interest, public participation, we will therefore, after today's meeting, call for public comments through um, radio, print, and social media. We will advertise 
um, and, and, and safe to say honorable chairperson, there is a process um, that we have to follow in terms of supply chain management, where in which we'll have to um, process the advertisement. When the advertisement has been put out, uh, we will give um, 60 days to the public to submit their comments. And this decision was taken um, during Manco yesterday that because of the timing upon which we'll, 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 we'll send the advert out, which should be 4th of December, many people are already uh, not in the office, uh, either due to COVID-19, and some of which during the December period will be at home and will not have access to their emails and whatnot. So uh, the Manco then decided that we should uh, give the public at least 60 days to respond, which should lapse on the, uh, on the uh, 4th of the second month in the coming year, that is 2021. After this call for public comments, then we'll also consider oral submissions. As we know, honorable members, some of the stakeholders would be more comfortable submitting oral submissions to parliament and that we have scheduled for the week of the 9th of February until the 12th of February next year. After we have considered all of those, Honorable Chairperson will then um, roll out public hearings in, in provinces, uh, with the first one being Limpopo and the last one being the Western Cape, as the list goes. So we have not yet allocated specific dates on this one, Honorable Chair, as this was tabled yesterday at Menco, and the decision was that um, we should go back to our calendar and, and, and see the framework of Parliament as well, because we need to take that into, co in cons into consideration. However, a, a, a proposal which was uh, which the Menko was in favor of was that first and foremost, the committee will not be split into two. We will deal wholly with the, with, with, the, with the public hearings. So the whole committee will travel to provinces and the target is four days per province, um, no, four areas per province. So that's why then the dates would have not been flagged into the draft project plan as yet, because we need to take all those things into consideration. And thereafter, we'll submit the, 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 the final draft to the committee for, for, for further consideration. Uh, we are looking, Honorable Chairperson, to submit the report on the expropriation bill at least by the 30th of June in 2021. So that's when the final report will be tabled to the House um, as we are projecting. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I'm not sure if the members will probably have questions in this regard. Okay, I, I, I think I think uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, this should be an item that we debate as as the committee because uh, the the proposal that you're bringing, especially the white uh, area, uh, not the one that has been done there, it's a proposal that we did as as the management committee of this portfolio committee. Then it's brought to the committee to adopt it or maybe to comment on, on, on the issues. Um, the, the reason, uh, honorable members, I think uh, Ms. Martinez has clearly indicated uh, that instead of 30 days, uh, are we uh, calling for public comments? We felt that it must be 60 days, knowing how busy December is, people going to their rural areas uh, where they don't have internet, all these gadgets uh, are not working for them to, to, to submit their comments and all that. That is why you felt that. And having learned lessons from the ad hoc uh, committee of section 25 amendment, uh, where the, there was um, a call for public comments in December, people commented and complained that uh, you can call for public comments in December. It was then had to be extended up to the to the to the end of of January or mid February. That is why we felt that it must be sixty days. But then uh, let me call for comments on this, uh, honourable members, honourable Van Staden. Uh, it's only your hand that is up on this issue. Uh, other honourable members, uh, they're not here. Uh, honourable Van Staden. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. On the call for public comments, and as you said now that December can be a problem, but I hear you, it's December and January for the comments. Why not rather start the process for the 60 days in January for January and February, when it, it, it can solve this problem of uh, the Christmas season in December? Just, just a, a, a note from my side. Thank you. 
thank you, Honorable Fastidian. Uh, no other comments from the Honorable Members on, 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 on this uh, plan? Uh, Ms. Martinez? Thanks, Honourable Chairperson. Interesting that the question is coming up. Um, Honourable Chair, as I said earlier, that um, this is a draft plan um, of the Portfolio Committee. So we really depend on the Portfolio Committee to state whether this plan is acceptable as it is, or rather there are amendments that we should make thereof. Like, for instance, if the committee takes a decision right now that um, Honourable von Staden's proposal should stand, then we'll go back and, and change the dates as per the requirements of the portfolio committee, because this remains a draft program of the portfolio committee. Thanks, Chair. Honorable uh, Jobo. Honorable Jobo. Yes, yes, Chairperson. Yes, yes, Your hand is up. Yes, Chair. Okay, over to okay. you then. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Um, if I may, I like to support com <laughs> Honorable Van Staden to move to January. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, then I, I think there is no objection on 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 that, uh, Miss Martinez. Then, uh, on the issue of uh, calling for public comments, I don't know which date then are we going to use for January? When are we going to, to advertise? It means then the process of advertising, you must work on it over the December holidays. Then in January, let's say, 4th of January, they, then the advert is out for calling for public comments. Um, then is it going to be 30 days or 60 days again? Honorable Chair? Ch yes, Chairperson. if I may. Um, yes, uh, let, let's take before. Yeah, Honorable Mjoba. Yes, Chairperson. Um, before Unola, uh, the 60 days, if possible, can we continue with 60 days? Yeah, that was the intention, Chair. Sorry to chip you now. But I said if we if we don't use December, then we stick with 60 days for January and February. Although February is just got 28 days, then you just carry on to, so the, from, so, as you said, from the 4th of January to the 4th of March, uh, when it will probably cover the 60 days. You understand what I'm saying? I, let me come in, honorable members. Um, the reason we had 60 days, it was because there is December holiday. That's why we, we then say it can be the 30 days that is 4th of December to 4th of January. That's why we had to add another 30 days to make it 4th of February. If you're saying then this advert must then go out in January, I think we have to go back to 30 days. That is the normal way of doing things. Uh, remember, we we this um, this bill uh, is of the public interest in the majority of the population of this country. So, to me, we we have presented a plan here that says that we would want, as the portfolio committee, to ensure that it is tabled by the end of um, by the end of June. So if then we moving this to maybe even, remember we'll start only with the public hearings after the, 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 the call for comments has closed. We, we don't do both at the same time. So that means if we're saying 4th of March, uh, it would then mean we will start with the public hearings mid-March towards end March. And, and, and remember, uh, we, we are going to go to nine provinces. When then will we finish that? That means then the 30th of June is also out. I think we also need to, to look at that. Um, that's my take on this, but I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not finalizing. Um, 
Uh, Ms. Martinez, uh, and, and I think uh, Ms. Ngema, uh, our legal person should also come in on this one. Over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to assist the portfolio committee, um, the, the, the normal time frame that is usually given is 30 days for public comment. However, I think it will assist the committee if we can advertise now so that we can maximize on the people that will be able to submit the public comments right away, like in December, and then extend it to January as it currently stands on the, on the, on the draft project plan. Unless then the committee says we should advertise in January for end of January, then we carry on like that. But I think it'll really assist us to have the two months um, time frame for the public comments, because some people will, in, in all honesty, be able to submit their public comments right away, and some will only be able to do so in January. I think, Chairperson, that'll be my submission for now. Uh, Denise, uh, Ms. Nyama, anything from your side before uh, I, I, I finalize on this matter? Ms. Nyama? Sure, I think Mangema is driving, so maybe you can oh, skip her call. Okay, okay, okay. Ms. Njobo, your hand was up, or you... I think, Chair, let's go back to square one. Yeah, Let's start I, I, on this one. Other fans say that. No, I agree. No, no, let's, no, I agree. Let's go back then to the original one. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Chair. Uh, 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 These this other members, they're not assisting uh, the process. Uh, uh, yes, Ms. Ngeba. Yes. Um, 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 um. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow you on Facebook while I also follow the other mini meeting on, on transport. So I just had to try and quickly come back. Um, the issue you have raised, basically, Chaperson, I think it's on point. And in order to ensure that we do not create any flaws or any room for contestations, we must definitely give it the time and as well as allow every form without looking every form of issues without looking so much on on how we do things so i do suggest chairperson as as you have indicated that we must separate the the the, the time calling for for submissions as well as the time when we start the, the 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 public hearings themselves so the two months that you suggested is looking good and and in terms of the time frame generally it is the committee that sets its own time frames I, I am aware that with the with the NCOP, they have set, set a specific six week cycle, but that does not really impact so much on the NA processes because in terms of the rules of the National Assembly and its portfolio committees, the timeframes are not set on how much and how much time must be taken for public participation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Miss 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 Ngema. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Martinez said, the challenge now, the two honor members have withdrawn their, 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 their debate. Oh, Ms. Martinez said, mine would be um, to, to ask you that to shift the date of the, um, of the advert. Maybe uh, so that we allow uh, enough time it not be the 4th of, of December. We can, um, I don't know when you're closing, but but yeah, I understand that we may close, but uh, the parliament doesn't actually close. Uh, 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 work continues even with, when we're not there. I would I would propose that uh, maybe on, on the, um, I don't know when the 10th is, the advert goes out on the 10th of December, so at its 10th of December to 10th of January, then 10th of January to 10th of February, uh, these 60 days. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the reason uh, honorable members were calling on this, they know that uh, the 15th, the 4th of December, people are still on the holiday uh, uh, mood. Though I don't know whether we're going to have holiday when we have a second wave of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, are taking us so aggressively right now. 
So I, 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 I'm just proposing that, uh, honorable members, if, if you allow us uh, that it not be 4th of December, say 10th of December to 10th of January, uh, I know some of the people will submit their, their comments even, even during that time, but you get, then the majority, at least 10th of January to 10th of February, we, we allow a lot of people to be in their offices, to be at work, to be able to, to link through the electronic uh, gadgets and have the internet. Uh, that, that, that is my proposal on this. And then we start other processes after the 10th of February. But still keeping in mind that, um, or maybe we can even shift to that one, say end of July, not end of June, uh, Ms. Martini said, end of June, we, we, end of July, we then table this to the parliament. Noted, Jefferson. We'll make so, such adjustments to the program and then revert to the committee. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Martinez. Uh, I think that is all about the program now. Um, uh, please note, honorable members, um, there will be only one uh, team going out to all the to all the provinces. Uh, I think in January we will we will we will come back to the members so that they, they indicate. But as we have seen, we will be starting in, in Limpompo, Pumalanga. I think you've seen the, the program. We won't change that. And we will finalize that. But we're looking at, at, at doing what has been done by the other committees, the NHI, the, 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 the Section 25 ad hoc committee where four uh, venues or four regions or four districts are, are visited during these public hearings. Um, four per province, and then starting at Limpompo, Pumalanga, and you will, the last one will be Western Cape. Um, that is the program. Then I think we're going to minutes now, Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, the first minutes that are before the Committee for Consideration and Adoption are the minutes of a meeting that was held on the 17th of November, um, where we had the BRRR briefings, the AG, DPWI, uh, PMTE, and all the entities. I would now request the Honorable Members to just zoom into the attendance register to check if there's any anomaly that we need to fix. And in the absence thereof, we'll just zoom into the deliberations as well as the resolutions of that meeting. Honorable members, those are the minutes uh, of our last meeting. I'm then inviting comments and, and corrections from all the members. Yes, my apology for this meeting, Matt. I don't see it there. I normally make apology via the <laughs> WhatsApp. <laughs> and, 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 and that one is very clear. You are the only person that doesn't fail to make an apology. Chairperson? Yes, Honorable Kopane. Yes. Do you remember I connected and then because of the problem of connection, I disconnected several times there. So I don't know. Yes. Okay. Uh, your apologies there, Honorable Kopane. Oh, Honorable Van Staden was part yeah, of Yeah, no, sorry. Sorry. No, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Demacar. Oh, no, sorry, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Any, any information on the, on the discussions, Honorable Members, on the Actual minutes. Honorable members on the actual minutes. Can I on then get a move? Yes, Honorable Jobo. On my side, everything it's it's okay. I can move the adoption. Honorable Jobo is moving for the adoption of the minutes. Uh, can I get a, a seconder, honorable members? Can I get a second, uh, honorable members, on the 
Chess, but Honorable okay. Samantha has her hand up. Oh, okay. Sorry. Apologies. Honorable Graham Murray, your hand is up. Oh, thanks, Chair. I was just putting my hand up to say that I'm happy to second um, Honorable Mjogo's um, adoption of the minutes. Thank you, Honorable Graham Murray. Uh, the minutes, uh, they seconded the motion to move for the adoption. Uh, can we go to the second set of minutes? Uh, Ms. Martinez? All right, Chair, I'm going to it now. Um, the other challenge that we usually experience, Chairperson, just as I'm trying to um, open the other set of minutes, can honorable members please uh, keep us updated? Like, for instance, we usually get apologies, then we record the apologies. And later you see the honorable members joined in the meeting, either uh, towards the end or whatever. Can the honorable members please update us if they're now going to be coming into the meeting? Because then it creates such a confusion uh, where a member is recorded as absent or rather having apologized, yet um, they come into the meeting and we're not aware. All right. All right. Thank you, Chair. I will move into the meeting of the 18th of November where we were considering and adopting the B triple R 2019-20, and then we considered and adopted other minutes of previous meetings. Is there again, honorable chair, I'd like the honorable members to just check <laughs> if the attendance is captured correctly, or if there were any apologies, um, is there off? Uh, Ms. Martinez, the, the minutes, they not yet showing on our screens. Oh, let me just try and go back into a chair because they are showing on my side. Apologies about that. Let me just try again. Are they now showing? Yes. All right. Thanks, Chair. Yes. 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 I would yes. like to request the honorable members to check the attendance register if it's been properly captured. Yeah, it was this meeting. It's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Darren had apologized for that meeting, so he was not in. <laughs> so we move over. Uh, but but, but for this meeting, but but it doesn't matter. But for this meeting, Honorable Tring had apologized, but later came on and and, uh, and and discussed in the meeting and debated. But yeah, it doesn't matter. We have shown her as having attended the meeting. I think you, you, you when, with your earlier comments, maybe you're referring to that. Yes, sure. Um, any on the issue of the minutes, honorable members? Hey, I'm not checking this issue now. Can I get a, a, an, an honorable member who is going to move for the adoption of the minutes? Chairperson, I move the adoption of the of the minutes. Thank you, Honorable Mjobo. A, a seconder for the mover. I'll second, Chair. Oh, okay. Thank you, Honorable Hicklin, uh, for for seconding the 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 motion. Um, I think um, the minutes have been then adopted. Um, any other business, Ms. Martinez? Nothing else from my side, Chair, apart from the announcement that next week is our last meeting on the 2nd of December, when which we'll be getting a briefing from, from the DPWI on the um, status of the implementation of our oversight um, recommendations. Remember, we had two major oversight visits, one to Bay Bridge and the second one to Kosi Bay, that is the Jersey barrier. So we then uh, submitted the recommendations through the speaker to the minister. So then we would like to, as a committee, uh, follow up on the implementation of those recommendations. We have deliberately omitted the, the most recent oversight visit recommendations, which is Acacia Park and, and Pelican Park, to, uh, that is um, jointly par parliamentary villages. Obviously, because the House hasn't heard that report, and therefore we can't then expect the minister to have implemented any of those resolutions. Um, even though we know that uh, the committee felt that some of the recommendations don't need to wait for that process to take place, but as a matter of procedure, it, it would be unfair for us to expect them to report on the implementation at this point. So we're only getting the 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 the, the implementation the the 
status report on the implementation on only two uh, major oversight uh, reports that we submitted to the minister. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nola. I think I think that last meeting that we will be having, it it um, we really we really need to have that and check those recommendations. Remember, we discussed the reports of of those oversight visits and we had clear recommendations. Um, tomorrow we will be dealing with the first and second uh, quarterly reports, ne? Ms. Martinez, do we have the documents yet? Yes, Chair. The documents were submitted. Um, I saw them earlier in, in my in my inbox. So okay, I'll so you you, you still go to send them to us, eh? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. 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 I believe honorable members um uh, in the sitting today, uh, there will be deliberations and, and declarations on the our B Triple R report. Uh, all the best to all those that will be presenting declarations on behalf of their political uh, parties uh, uh, from this committee. I know uh, there's definitely going to be some fireworks as we always do, but always I, I appreciate the really honorable members. I really appreciate the way we engage as this committee. Um, I, I, I've said this several times, but it is good to chair a committee where there are no fireworks. There can be fireworks in parliament, but we don't need fireworks here. We don't have a fire extinguisher in the committee where there is a serious exchange of wet and blows as it is happening in other committees. We really know that we all here on the ticket of being public representatives. And as such, us exchanging blows is not good for those people that are listening to us, for those people that voted for us to be here in parliament. Let's continue doing the good work and, and engaging in a manner that uh, also assists the person who is listening to us to understand where we want to go, what are we trying to discuss in this meeting. Thank you again. Um, let's meet uh, in the plenary at two. Uh, Ms. Martinez, I thank you again to our 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 A team. Our A team is doing well. Um, the meeting is adjourned, honourable members. Thank you. Stay well. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, bye, everybody. Uh, bye.